Greetings, I'm Allison Levy, Digital Scholarship Editor at Brown Library and Project Director for Born Digital Scholarly Publishing, Resources and Roadmaps, an NEH Institute on Advanced Topics in the Digital Humanities. This course unit focuses on integrating narrative and design and features Shahzad Bashir in conversation with Victoria Hindley. Let me begin with introductions. Shahzad Bashir is the Aga Khan Professor of Islamic Humanities and Professor of History and Religious Studies at Brown University. He also serves as an Associate Editor of the journal History and Theory, Studies and the Philosophy of History. His most recent book is A New Vision for Islamic Pasts and Futures, a digital publication whose custom design interface performs the argument it is presenting. This work will be published in August by MIT Press. His earlier published work has been con has concerned with, excuse me, has been concerned with temporality, poetry, the study of Sufism and Shiism, messianic movements originating in Islamic contexts, and religious representations of corporeality. He is currently developing a major research project on a vast corpus of multilingual literature produced in India during the period 1750 to 1850 and tentatively titled Seeing from India, an Alternative Genealogy for Modern History. Victoria Hindley joined the MIT Press in 2016 after working in publishing and the arts for two decades in both the US and Europe. Acquisitions Editor for Visual Culture and Design, Victoria develops a body of work that is rigorous, politically engaged, culturally informed, and which centers underrepresented perspectives and understudied questions. Publications include A Black Gaze by Tina M. Camped, White Sight, Visual Politics and Practices of Whiteness by Nicholas Mertzoff, and Decolonizing Design by Dory Tunstall. Victoria is the commissioning editor for the Visual Culture book series On Seeing in partnership with Allison Levy of Brown University and a founding member of the MIT Press's grant program for diverse voices. She is a frequent guest speaker on contemporary publishing and a research advisor at TransArt Institute for Creative Research Berlin. Her artist books and installations, which examine the book form and constructions of power, have been exhibited and collected internationally and are held in collections at Yale University, UC Berkeley, and the US Library of Congress. Before Shazad and Victoria discuss the importance of integrating narrative and design, I'm going to do a brief uh, project demo. So this is the landing page for uh, a new vision for Islamic pasts and futures. It will be published in August uh, of this year by MIT Press. One enters the digital publication uh, and immediately encounters this uh, visual table of contents or uh, networked uh, table of contents from which readers can choose uh, their portal of entry. And I'm hovering over different icons. Each represents a different chapter section. And you can see that indicated uh, at the bottom here uh, by chapter number as well for those readers who need additional signposting. I can also freeze that view and explore uh, neighboring portals uh, which, which bring me into related material. At any point, readers uh, desiring a more conventional table of contents have that available. And from this page as well, they can enter uh, into different sections uh, of their choosing. I'm going to bring us into a section of chapter five, the grave of time. And I want to show off more uh, of the integrated design elements uh, so, so critical uh, to, this, uh, to this book. Uh, there are various ways to present 
uh, illustrations, for example. Readers might encounter them in stacks uh, and have the agency to rearrange, uh, reposition, uh, break down hierarchies. This is an intentional overlay of text uh, by the image. We find another uh, stack of images here. And all of these are details of a contemporary uh, installation by the artist Lara Balotti that inspired uh, the cover design that I showed a moment ago. At the bottom of each chapter section, uh, we get uh, a detail of that constellation, a reminder uh, that one not need uh, read this in any linear fashion, um, but certainly can move around to different sections of the book uh, without going back to that initial constellation. So from here, I will go into life stories, which brings us uh, to chapter one. I can also move through this chapter sequentially um, or move around as well. Again, uh, we find a variety of uh, image formats that are all uh, strategically uh, selected uh, to uh, aid the reader uh, in reading through the narrative. Another way to move through the text, of course, is to return to that constellation. And here, I will go to uh, Lost and Found Nation uh, and pause just for a moment on this very powerful image uh, photograph taken by Gordon Parks, uh, published in Life magazine. Uh, and there's a complex layering here between the main figure who appears in focus in the foreground, others uh, behind her out of focus, uh, and then the Taj Mahal uh, as a backdrop. The depth of field in this image captures what the author tries to explain about the nature of Islam's ideology in which the past is constructed with eyes on a particular future. Uh, so that's just one uh, very compelling use of imagery uh, in this text. I'll move to one last section, staying in this chapter, reading the stars. Um, which also features pull quotes that call attention uh, to the very, uh, very elegant uh, writing. Uh, and also we have overviews uh, that remind the reader uh, of, the, uh, of each chapter's um, uh, main, main thesis, uh, which is also presented in an introduction um, which is accessible through that constellation, and then also a list of resources, works cited, uh, as well as suggestions for further reading. And these pop-up boxes appear uh, across all of the chapter sections. Uh, so with that, I will uh, return to that constellation uh, and uh, leave you here. So this was just a very brief overview, highlighting some of the very special features uh, of uh, a new vision for Islamic past and futures. And now I will turn uh, things over to Shazad and Victoria, and they will discuss in much greater depth uh, the, the process of, of integrating narrative and design and, and why it is so important. Victoria. Thank you so much, Allison. Thank you for that uh, very generous uh, introduction. It is such a pleasure to join you both. I've been looking forward to this conversation very much. And as Allison mentioned today, we're going to focus on some of the conceptual practices related to design and narrative with respect to this wonderful digital publication um, that Allison just introduced us to a new vision for Islamic pasts and futures. As you both know, my experience is squarely grounded in print books. And so the idea of working on a born digital publication was rather new to me. Additionally, while MIT Press publishes across dozens of fields in the humanities and the sciences, we don't have a particular focus on Islamic studies. And so, Initially, I really questioned whether or not we were the right place for this project when I first heard about it. But then I met you and Shazad. And after our first discussion, I immediately 
immediately knew that this was a brilliant fit for the MIT Press. And to give you a little bit of context for this realization, I'll mention that I'm interested in work that examines how visual and material culture are almost always inscribed with power. So I'm searching for manuscripts that investigate what's at stake in that power, who has access to it, who doesn't, and why that is. And so it was with this in mind, Shazad, that your book um, immediately struck me as not only having the very important potential to increase understanding about Islam, I could see that it also asked us to think critically about how we produce history. And I think these are both vitally important uh, imperatives. As a commissioning editor, I am always first and foremost looking for this kind of rigorously researched work that's driven by a bold argument. And an argument that offers something new, a new way to think about um, how we're comprehending the world and ultimately um, gives us a new and valuable contribution to knowledge. I'm also very keen to find work that's beautifully written with an audience in mind um, that has both specialist knowledge and general knowledge who might be interested in the subject. So uh, it was very clear to me that um, your manuscript provided all of this and more. And so today I'd like to talk a little bit with you about how you worked within the digital space to support and expand your extremely interesting arguments and insights. As we've often discussed, Shazad, um, it seems to me that we share a real uh, commitment to raising and exploring uh, um, sometimes challenging questions about how our canons of knowledge are formed. Um, you've given us this extraordinary digital book that presents a new way to understand Islamic culture and history across 14 centuries. And in many ways, I think your publication also examines how we develop meaning and how those meanings in the plural become part of knowledge and how knowledge is produced and by whom. In this light, I see your publication, both in its form and its content, as an investigation of the relationship between power and knowledge, and to the extent possible, an act of decolonization. I wonder if you could speak to this, and particularly how the digital space uh, underscores and serves this aim. Thank you very much, Victoria and Alison both. Uh, greetings to everyone who is watching this. It's a pleasure to participate in this conversation. Thank you. I, uh, I feel like I should thank both Alison and Victoria, not just for this conversation, but for the long process of getting here. Um, in, in a way, the, the, the process of writing this book began very much with a conversation with Alison. And then I think, Victoria, you were the editor we didn't know we were looking for <laughs> until we found you. So, so I think it, it, you know, there is a kind of fortuitousness about it um, in terms of the dovetailing of various aspects of uh, what I was imagining I was doing um, <clears throat> um, and how it was produced and then what kind of an um, outlet there would be in terms of publication, et cetera. Um, and um, so I feel very much that I agree with you that the, the, the main question that was uh, driving my work um, before this even became a digital um, publication was the question of uh, knowledge and power and their complete interconnectedness. And the canon that was of concern to me was how Islam has been represented in, in modern societies, uh, not just in, in the Western world, but actually in Muslim societies themselves. Um, as well. So, um, so I wanted to actually then go back to essentially a kind of first principles approach. How does knowledge actually get produced? And in asking that question of Islamic materials, I wanted to create something that was um, constantly aware of the producer of knowledge and that which is produced. So that the person writing, the historian or the anthropologist or the scholar can never hide behind some kind of an abstract authority. 
Um, so I wanted to bring that perspective to everything that I look at by it's, and looking by looking at a text or an image or a building to think about what is structurally what it is doing, but also where it came from, who sponsored it, how did it come into being, what were the power relations there, and then also simultaneously be aware of what are my relationship, why am I interpreting it in this way, in these things. And this is where the question of time became very significant, that because time pertains to all human um, actions, human products, and so on. So I initially, when I was working on this, um, the idea was to thematize certain aspects of time that are that have become that are highly discussed in the philosophy of history. Um, and when the digital um, possibility came up, it just allowed uh, making that argument in a much more sophisticated way and actually providing the possibility of demonstrating the effects. Uh, usually in a print book, when one writes it, um, then one waits and sees what people say about it. Um, but here, because it's an interactive uh, thing, and then and then there was a way to build in what might be the possibilities of what, how the readers might do it. So it completely transformed my process of writing. The original idea was very much the same, um, but the product is certainly very different. But also it just, um, interacting with digital possibilities um, allowed me to think in more creative uh, ways. Thank you. That's wonderful. So let's let's um, expand on some of those points a bit. Um, you mentioned temporality, um, and and I'd like to touch on uh, temporality hand in hand with narrative, as I understand it. Um, this relationship is quite central to your thinking. Um, and so in brief, I'm referring here to how time influences our perspectives and how perspective determines narrative, allowing us to, to see, to engage with, to recognize things in different ways from different vantage points, which is something that I think you really um, expand upon beautifully in, in the book. And, I, and I, I imagine you would argue that temporality is critical to how we comprehend the world. Um, so could you talk a little bit more about this as, as, you, as you alluded to just a moment ago um, and how just specifically how the publication supports this argument through its form? Um, yes, absolutely. So in a way, for, for my purposes, and in, even in the philosophy and theory of history, the narrative and temporality are, have been inherently con connected. In a way, especially in a historical narrative, what the historian is doing is, is actually producing an account of time. What goes into it, what is, doesn't, what is included, what is excluded, etc. Those are all issues that a, the historian actually takes into account in, in creating the narrative. And then by that token, uh, the historian essentially ends up creating the effect of time for the possible reader. Now, so there are actually then there are two temporalities involved already in that process because there is the, the time of the experience of the event that happened. And then the time that the historian creates in creating the narrative that is made available to the reader. Um, now in a, in a when I was working on this project originally, I had this uh, challenging aspect that I wanted to, to uh, make the argument that if we change how time is constructed, um, the narrative completely changes, the story changes, so we can take the same basic facts and create entirely different narratives. And that's what historians are doing in various ways. Um, and I wanted to show that Part of the challenge or the problem with the way Islam has been perceived is that there is a notion that there is a single uh, narrative of time, a single narrative, a single temporality that is associated with Islam. But when we look at uh, things that Muslims have produced or non-Muslims non have said about Islam, what we actually have is a, a, a cacophony of different times. People are imagining time different ways. There, there is millions of different narratives and depends on class, on gender, on positionality, and so on. Um, so I could make this argument in my own narrative, but I had this um, feeling that the, the reader would say, but here you are producing a narrative that is fixed within a certain number of pages and going a certain way. 
Um, so the digital possibility then provided um, how to actually show the effect of this. Now, this is not an escape from narrative. It actually is an affirmation of the power of narrative and the fact that we must create narratives. But narratives are imbued with politics, that the narratives are imbued with aesthetics, with, um, uh, with all kinds of different aspects um, of human existence. Um, so what I ended up doing, and this is where the, and the visual table of contents becomes so interesting, is that it allows, um, it, it, there is a narrative if someone wants to read it in a straightforward way, there is the regular table of contents, they can go through it and see what narrative um, I might have construct, construct in one way. But then the visual uh, narrative, because um, it already shows how it's up to the reader to deconstruct what I have constructed and create a different narratives of, from the same sections. Um, and they can do it either through the clusters that are present visually, or they can do it random as well. Now, the, the wonderful thing about this for my purposes is, is that I actually do not know and cannot possibly know what the experience of reading this book would be uh, for a possible reader. There are certain things that I've imagined. So I make myself available in terms of what my logic was, but but I actually want the uh, the reader to be able to and uh, reader the reader and the viewer to be able to participate in the process of creating history, um, and and that's where it it is not about just about Islam as you mentioned. It's actually a much more general point about the creation of history and the power of history, the and and why. History is so extremely significant. Identity is based upon history um, of any different types. Uh, and but who gets to construct those narratives? And how do they, how can we challenge those constructions? Um, and, and so going back to the word that you used earlier in terms of decolonization, um, there, that's very much a part of the work I'm doing. Uh, the only thing I would say is that for me, decolonization is not an end goal. It's actually a process because we are embedded in these power relations. So I'm interested in decolonization as an endless process um, and as, a, as an attitude towards knowledge rather than um, another kind of decolonized knowledge that somehow can overcome the colonized knowledge that we might have. Um, and so, and that's where the, the, the ability to scramble the narrative that is actually provided to the reader viewer um, is, is the ultimate way in which I can show, um, show that how this perspective would actually work. Um, yeah, I appreciate that so much, Shazad, as you know. I mean, <clears throat> in a way, it seems to me what we often talk about is how to normalize a kind of multiplicity of thinking and seeing and comprehending. And um, it's one of the things that I admire most about your work. Um, you mentioned that narratives are, are both essential, which I agree with, and they are invariably imbued with politics, which I also agree with. And I find both points um, to be extremely interesting and not in conflict with one another, but simply the reflection of, of reality. Um, in my view, you know, visual and material culture are, are, are rarely, if ever, neutral, as I, as I mentioned earlier. And um, I think, I think that in spite of this, or because of this, they have always been central to meaning making. Um, one of the things that I, I also appreciate about your book is the way that you think very carefully about images uh, with respect to, to what we're talking about and, and how you analyze them <clears throat> in such a way that you are not setting them up simply to illustrate a point, to serve a point, but to, lend themselves to your larger argument by showing us that we should be wary of reducing any kind of visual evidence um, to a singular interpretive perspective. And in this way, I believe that your publication models a kind of very critical um, visuality and, and, and visual literacy, as I, as I often say. Um, so I'm wondering, could you speak a bit more about this with respect to images, um, how you worked with them, and how others working in this realm with images might draw on your experiences? 
Thank you. Yes, I think, and especially when when it came to the question of the use of images, that's where I think the the kind of the ambition of this work was utterly transformed by going digital because of the possibility of using images um, extensively and in very specific ways. So, for for my purposes, in a way. I came to appreciate through the practice of writing this book um, that visuality and visual material can be used and should be used to create rhetoric in the same way as we use words to create rhetoric. And actually it's the, you know, in a way a kind of concatenation between the text and the image that happens throughout the book in the two columns. Um, it allows, um, this this game of construction and deconstruction that that it, that book is trying to show with narrative it is shown it is very much present there with the images as well. Uh, in terms of the the images that I do use, um, uh, in a way there were two different aspects to it. One is the actual selection of the image and to find images that that convey a kind of density of meaning. Um, that is not reducible to words actually. And the, there's a whole chapter in the book which is on visualization of the past. Um, so that, the message of that chapter is that there's things about the visual that cannot actually just be put into words. But the book as such and its use of images try to exemplify this as well. Um, and so I try to uh, figure out, uh, find images that that in a way they are interrelated with what is being argued in the text, but they also expand. Um, so for example, the, the image that, um, that Alison uh, focused on um, by Gordon Parks about um, Etel Sharif, the, the daughter of Elijah Muhammad, um, that's such a powerful image. And, and the, the power of that image actually does, does, does not need to be explained in a way if someone is looking at it, especially those of us who are used to photography because of the subject actually looking directly into the camera. Uh, in a way, um, the camera always is, is shoots, it domesticates, but here is the subject shooting back through her eyes. Um, and, and so th there is a, the, the power structure in that image uh, is exactly what is in a way the theology of the nation of Islam, talking back to American culture, uh, cycling it through Islam. Um, and, the, and the way she's dressed, the way the group is pre uh, present together, the way the depth of field is created between the human figures and the Taj Mahal. Um, all of these things are very much part of the the, the narrative of that the nation of Islam came up with about its own existence as well. Um, but, and the, the narrative gradually unfolds it. I talk about what Elijah Muhammad had to say about time. I talk about what his critics had to say, what people today might say, people who grew up in the nation who had a problem with it, etc. So it, it falls in time because that is a, the nature of narrative. This image right in the beginning in a way anticipates all of that is what is coming. So my hope then is that as someone is reading it, they see the image, it sticks in the mind. Then you go through the narrative, then you will feel compelled to go back to this image and you see it differently. So in a way that, so, so I, the images I tried to, I, that I picked were, were trying to do this um, throughout. But the digital form also allowed the possibility of using placement as a rhetorical technique. So that's where these, the, the, the stacks come in, uh, where it's up to the reader or the viewer to actually circle between them, to blow them up, to look at the details, to, and they overlay the text very deliberately, as Alison mentioned, because they kind of show that the, ordinarily the text is dominant because it's on, it's on the left side, and, um, but here the image can be made be more dominant, all the images can be seen together as well in a single gallery. So one can basically ignore the text if someone wants to do it only visually as well. Similarly, the images that are placed in a series of three, they're doing various types of comparative work. Um, so, um, so all the, we initially, when we designed the book, we came up with a kind of, um, a, um, a table of different possibilities that was developed very in a very considered way. And then I use that in the same way I might use certain words or certain ways of expressing. Um, so it, it, 
um, you mentioned the word visual literacy in a way the writing the book was one of the ultimate exercises for me to becoming more visually literate and and that's the part of the work that I'm also hoping to continue in the next project. Thank you, Shazad. Um, I uh, find everything that you just said extremely resonant with the work that I do on a daily basis. And um, it seems to me that images are inscribed with rhetorical meaning. I think that's a wonderful phrase. Uh, um, always and sometimes knowingly and many times un unwittingly, right? And part of visual literacy, it seems to me, is learning how to, to read them um, regardless of what they may be aware of themselves. And so I, I, I find it really thrilling that you analyze uh, images in the book uh, from so many different perspectives, so many different temporalities, so many different positionalities. I think it's a, um, I think it's a, a remarkable um, exercise to emulate toward that multiplicity of thought that we were just talking about. Okay, let's switch gears for just a, a bit here. Um, you, you have uh, cited um, the terrific uh, scholar Joanna Drucker in a uh, forthcoming essay. Um, uh, and, and, and you mention um, that books, and here you're referring to all manner of books, print and digital, should be seen as performances aimed at creating meaning in the virtual space between authors and readers. Um, I love this description and I find it to be spot on. Um, could, could you speak a bit more to the ways in which your book is, and, and here I'm quoting uh, Drucker, a performative space for the production of reading. I mean, I think we've kind of been hinting at that and leading up to it, but but I'd love to hear you you speak to that with respect to performance. Yes, absolutely. Actually, um, one of the interesting things about uh, reading or thinking with uh, Johanna Drucker was uh, coming across her work after having written the book. So I actually didn't uh, know, uh, I'd come across her work, but I hadn't read in detail. It's only when I was writing the essay reflecting on what I had done that I read it more carefully. Um, and it was like finding a long lost friend. I mean, and this was what she says, what she uh, articulates was very much my experience of, uh, of writing this book. Um, and um, what I especially appreciated um, was uh, exactly the, the pink thing that you were pointing to is that the, a book is a performance, that it comes to reside outside the author in some sort of space where it becomes a book only when someone actually reads it. Um, uh, it actually has, this has made me um, reflect and think uh, differently about my previous books, um, because in particularly in the academic setting, a book, um, and even the, the use of the word author for it, um, it gets connected to one's person because one's name on is on it and and first the first time when you actually get a book that has your name on it it is just it seems almost unbelievable that this thing actually exists um, but as the book exists in time uh, even in the print books that I've published what I've experienced is very much that it becomes an object in itself. It's uh, it's no longer in my head. I even have to look up what I did I write, etc. So so therefore to think about a book as this performative space that has been performed or words that have been performed and then they acquire different lives depending on who the audience is etc was was exceedingly resonant for all types of books uh, for me um, now in the digital book i think the um the exact same thing is is very much valid so i entirely agree with with drucker that the a good book, whether it's digital or not digital, doesn't really make a difference or a bad one. So it's, you know, it, it's what kind of performance it is doing. And the digital medium simply provides certain types of tools to make that performance happen. And for my purposes, because of the specific concern I had with the, the question of narrative and temporality, the digital uh, form provided uh, invaluable tools to create the best possible performance that, that I could do. 
Um, and, and from there on, um, there is an interesting temporality difference here that in a way the, it, when a book is published and someone reads it and the performance happens, um, there, it, it can happen over time. I published a book 20 years ago and someone might read it and then they might have, if they haven't heard, thought about this particular topic, it might be a completely new thing for them, but it's completely old for me. But in the digital form, because the reader and the viewer is constantly being asked to make decisions about where to go next. So the performance becomes temporally much more immediate. Um, and there too, this was exceedingly valuable for me uh, because that was precisely the point I was trying to make about time and narrative. Um, and right, so this is why the, the form and the content of this book um, are, were just completely organically connected. Um, and so there's a, um, it really felt like um, I even at some point tried thinking about, is there some other, is the second shoe gonna drop? I'm gonna find out this doesn't work because it works so well <laughs> uh, in terms of what I wanted to, to convey. That's right, I mean, it is, it is an ideal model of the perfect union of form and content. It's nearly platonic, isn't it? I mean, really. Um, I love this idea of a book's afterlife. Um, you're so right. And as, as one who publishes, uh, you know, 20 to 25 books a year, I, I really can only be focusing on the one that's in front of me at any given moment. And then when I come back to the ones that I've published, they do have a different resonance for me, a palpable resonance, but a different one. Um, and this idea of digital tools allowing you to provide the best performance is uh, so well uh, articulated. Um, because as you point out, the intellectual labor is still the same. You still have to make the uh, convincing um, argument. The argument still has to carry uh, through, even when you are encouraging the reader to engage with the process, the argument has to draw the reader um, through the work. So I appreciate that very much. Um, let's talk a little bit about how this uh, work um, comments on, on the ways in which the discipline of history is evolving. You've mentioned history a few times, you've mentioned, how the book challenges some conventional ideas about how we think about um, performing history. Um, so I'm, I'm curious how, how, um, how the publication supports your aims to work with an evolving uh, and to help evolve uh, a concept of, of history, what you might call, and I may be taking a bit of a leap here, but what you might call um, allowing uh, the reader to escape to other realms. Um, in other words, how does this publication show readers how to be their own historians, as you mentioned? Um, thank you. So in a way, this is the, the, the largest question that was in a in some ways in the background of my mind as I was working on this project, but had become foregrounded after its completion. Um, because in a way I couldn't actually know what the ultimate argument would be or how it might um, have general, uh, very general application or, or um, possibilities that it would produce. Um, and, and there, um, the more I have thought about it, um, it's the, the general move in, in the philosophy and theory of history has been to dislodge the historian, um, historian's unquestionable authority. Modern history is born at the same time as modern nationalism. Um, and it, the story of history is connected very much to the story of nations. Um, and so earliest in the 19th century when, when history started to be produced, they are in the service, in the political service. To this day, history departments are organized by regions and the regions are named by nations. Um, so there's an intimate connection between um, politics and power and history 
Uh, and that's why for the longest time history was such an important discipline in any modern university. But what has happened over the past 20, 30 years is that people have really challenged that. And as people have become much more aware and suspicious about exercise of power that happens through, um, uh, through assertions about the past. Um, now, in, in that, um, on, so there is a kind of divided discussion. On the theory side, people have questioned very much, that, is it possible to say anything about the past that is factual? Uh, or is it just everyone is making it up? And it's all, there's no difference between fiction and history. Um, or on the other side is um, uh, very positive as historians who say, no, this is all junk and there are facts and there are real things happen and therefore. So I find both of those options to be um, um, unsatisfactory because it's history is not fiction. It has a lot of things common in fiction, but things do happen. Guns exist, people die. So they, they, you know, those things are they're very uh, real, but how are they to be interpreted? And how the narrative is produced? What is the culpability and the responsibility, ethical, political, uh, in any which way of the person who makes the claim with respect to the narrative that they are presenting? What is history in line with the nation? What is history against a nation? What does it mean to say, tell the history of the United States from a Native American perspective versus a, uh, a, a white American perspective? I mean, I mean, this is a very obvious example of how the world looks so different. It's the same facts. Um, so the now in that under underlying that are the complex problems that people, philosophers, have discussed about questions of the nature of evidence nature of narrative, and also how do we invoke context for understanding texts. Um, and so these are um, uh, discussions that, that have generated an immense amount of um, uh, abstract thought. Uh, it, hasn't, it has had limited impact on the actual practice of history, which uh, because of the power of disciplines, et cetera, continues to go on in a certain way. So in a way, what I'm trying to do with this book is to show the exact same tools that matter to the empiricist and the positivist can be put to entirely different use. Uh, we don't escape narrative, but we show what happens when you change narrative, the structures of narratives. Um, evidence matters tremendously, but as, it, as we see in the book, in the case of visual evidence, um, evidence is anything but clear. The simplest evidence is actually a question of who took the image, um, what is visible, what is invisible, and all of those things. And the book allows uh, engaging these abstract questions in a very concrete way through specific examples. And for me, the, the, the double structure of the book, the visual and the, and the textual, um, is kind of uh, allowing the historian, whether the author or the reader, to come and dwell in between text and context. The images are context for the text. The text is actually context for the image. So the, the, which one is the evidence and which one is the context can actually be flipped at various times, sometimes strategically, sometimes it's really up to the viewer to do it. So partly what I'm trying to show is that this notion of a strict text context is not a dichotomy. Um, it's, it's actually something that is fundamentally interconnected and they can be flipped in terms of their roles. Um, and the, and the, it's the, the format of the book actually allows uh, showing that and the effect of that um, um, in terms of um, because of the movement that is possible uh, within the experience of reading. One of the things that I very much like about the, the way the images are, have been used in the book is that um, when uh, an image, uh, a, a single image, or actually any of the images is made large, uh, there's a magnifying tool that can be used to go to various places. What that does actually is it, it turns the still image into a moving image but the movement is actually in the hands of the viewer. Not, it's not a video that, that the movement is coming from the source. Um, and that, so that is again, this kind of imparting of agency um, to the reader and the viewer 
as a participant in the process of the creation of the past and historical narrative. Um, to, to my mind, all the best history does this, whether in traditional form or in digital form. The, the, uh, as one thinks about the, the most influential history books, they are not the ones that actually tell one this and such and such things happened, but that allow people to, to come into the world where this was happening and, and to figure out a way of dwelling in it. And the digital form actually allows doing that in a, in a, in a kind of um, hypersensitized way. That's so interesting. I mean, in, in many ways, it seems to me that what you're saying here is that evidence as important as it is, is dependent upon the analysis of it, which in turn is a kind of evidence. And analyzing is a form of agency and allowing the reader, encouraging the reader to control form through which you analyze by examining an image uh, in high resolution increases agency, thus increases the capacity to, to analyze and puts the reader in, into a kind of interrogative position rather than a, a receptive position. Yeah, I think this is very exciting. Yeah, that's actually, that's a wonderful way of putting it, um, uh, putting the reader into, into an interrogative position. When we are teaching, that's all we're trying to do to make the students come into the interrogative position <laughs> rather than just receiving. And, and that's that's really is very much, uh, what the intention is, I think, in the book. Yes, book as Socratic method. <laughs> <laughs> um, wonderful. Okay, so so I think in in many ways what where where we've landed here, um, and um, what we've said in a couple of different ways is is that this book uh, prompted new paths of discovery for you, um, new ways of thinking and, and writing. And one of the ways that you've articulated this is to say that you see your role as creating certain conditions of possibility, which is another way of saying, I think, uh, what, we, what we just touched on to, to some extent. But I want to dig into that a little bit uh, farther because I think it's such a, um, a generative concept. And so if you could talk a little bit about what that means to you, what does it mean to create conditions of possibility? And, and, and moreover, what, what would you share uh, with the cohort um, about how, how they too um, can think about entering into conditions of possibility and, and creating conditions of possibility through digital publications? Um, yeah, that's a, I think and that is again one of those questions that I, I can reflect on best now that the, the book is actually complete in the process. Um, it, 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 you know, when one is writing or composing, um, it's a, it's, it, one has to follow one's instinct um, in a certain way as to where things go. And then it's only when it's complete then looking back at it, one can sort of see one's own patterns in, in a way. Um, I think the, the, I like the, the notion of conditions of possibility because for me, the best books are the ones that, um, that open the world to the, the reader um, and keeps, keeps it open, right? So not, sometimes a book can open it and then close it by giving a definitive interpretation. Um, so this, this form and the way the, this digital work works is that it opens it and it, it just asks the reader to keep opening more and more and more. Now, within that, the opening, however, uh, requires, of course, very much technical knowledge and interpretations, etc. So I think one of the hardest um, aspects of writing this book um, was to write um, in a way without presuming any prior knowledge of, of you know, contexts that are spread between, I think the earliest is, is the seventh century and the latest is the 21st, um, all over the world from uh, Asia, Africa, Europe, the Americas, um, and and I had I did immense amounts of work to actually figure out how to tell this story, which is doesn't make it into the book, 
but that work was, was necessary in order to create uh, a, a narrative that is hopefully gripping enough um, that both provides certain bases for understanding. Uh, so it's not just putting data out there. It's actually, there's an immense amount of work of interpretation that, that is done in the narrative and the images together in the rhetoric. Uh, and then bring that all to the end in each section to further opening. Um, and so in a way, the way I thought about this is that when the reader comes to the end of a section, whether they go into a, a section of the same chapter or they pick a chapter from the a section from the visual side, uh, the opening for the next part has already been created because the section, no section actually ends on anything that is closing the world, it's actually opening. And so it's the opening, uh, the ending, open-ended ending and the open-ended beginning of sections that then, then uh, put together the narrative for the reader. Um, and so that was a, a lot of conceptual work went into thinking about how to write in this way. Uh, and then lots and lots of experimentation with writing um, um, and then playing around with it uh, to see whether it works or didn't work. Um, and and th this is where the peer reviewers were exceedingly helpful, um, being able to affirm that it does work. And it works in ways that I can't anticipate because I couldn't try out all the different possibilities. Um, <clears throat> So in a way, the, the, the conditions of possibility issue is built in from the sentence level to the image level to the, to the whole, um, the book as it is presented. And yet, one of the things that I also wanted to be very conscious of is that the book, it is an authoritative book. It, it is written by, you know, so it's not uh, just a web page that is somewhere. It, it, it's a, it, it does convey a sense that person who was talking actually knows um, one can agree or disagree but but I did a lot of work to make sure that it's presented in a way that is it is an academic book like like uh, any other um, in terms of um, the um, kind of advice or suggestions for other authors I think that the the, the most critical aspect of um, doing work like this uh, is the ideas that stand behind the work. In that way, it's no different than any other book. Uh, what, to figure out what does one want to say? That's a very easy thing to claim or suggest and really quite hard to do. Um, and how to carry the idea about which one can possibly talk a lot easily, how to write it um, and how to present it, how to, how to create, go from an idea to a performance essentially um, is, is, the, is the really hard work, which is, I think, the humanities work um, that, that we all do. In the digital space, the challenging part is how to absorb the tools that are available um, as a kind of internalized language that then can be put to use. And, and in my experience, there were two parts to this. this. One is was to actually create and work very extensively on creating the interface that is gonna carry the book. Um, because the, the possibilities that are built into the interface uh, creates the elements that can then be utilized further on. So there's a lot of thought that went into creating the interface. And then once it had been created, then it really became that using the elements of the interface became like using vocabulary or certain rhetorical methods of how one writes, how to tell a story, where to be begin with an example or an explanation and how to alternate. So all those things that we know very well as humanists about, about writing, the, the elements that are part of the interface just became a part of my thinking. Uh, thinking about that they became kind of naturalized into in my in my mind to the point that once the I started um, writing I actually could not write outside of the, the the system and just insert it to look I actually had to write within it because I had to to look at it constantly um, uh, just as one looks at a Microsoft Word page 
uh, to see what the writing looks like, how long can this, the paragraph be or should be and all of those things. Um, so, I, so my advice would be um, to, to, to really, the first thing is really just to think the old fashioned way um, and, and to really figure out what one wants to say. And then, you know, work with the, the digital uh, tools to, to create something that is suited to that argument that uh, one wants to make. Yeah, that's so important. Um, <clears throat> I mean, in many ways, this process, from my point of view, uh, um, the interface was driven by your argument, not the other way around. And, and we all, all three of us worked together to kind of iterate that. And it was, <clears throat> it was fascinating for me to watch your process of intellectual inquiry evolve over that um, in tandem with the evolution of the interface, and to um, and to, you know, uh, tell me if I'm off the mark here. But it seemed to me um, that process allowed you to um, align yourself with um, some of the rhetorical arguments that were emerging with greater clarity and force for you. Some of which we've talked about here this afternoon and seeing that come to life in, in that space seemed to um, encourage you to uh, be even more bold in your argumentation, which I thought was quite wonderful. Um, yes, absolutely. I think that was very much, um, I think it, in that way, it, partly it was working with the digital format and partly uh, with the right interlocutors, especially you. And, and then once we got the peer reviewers reports as well, they were very helpful as well. And I think it's the conversations that happened when people had actually seen it that helped me to, to realize that actually the argument could be made more strident. Because in a way, part of the issue was that in the print format or in the regular book format, um, when one thinks about being able to carry an argument to a, a high degree of specificity and, and to one's own satisfaction, it requires one, the, the automatic burden that is triggered is the amount of text it would be required to actually explain this. And that's what tends to narrow the scope of books um, because of the amount of just language that is needed. And, and here, because the part of the language is actually the interface, uh, so it has a, an ability to be to make things and make the argument much more efficiently, which means that it can be made bolder to one's own satisfaction of believability and and uh, uh, and convincibility. With 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 that good old fashioned great deal of thought and intellectual labor. <laughs> Well, um, Shazad, this has been such a treat for me. You know, we, we've, we've talked many times, but we've rarely had the opportunity to relax into an expansive conversation. So I'm just, I'm just so honored to have the opportunity to do so with you. I think we're almost at time, but is there anything else that you or Alison would like to add before we sign off? I think the only thing I would say is thank you uh, for, for, I mean, this is where, you know, knowledge is produced through conversations. So all these conversations, whether in snippets or in longer form, as we just had, are invaluable for, for, for all the work. Well, thank you. It truly does feel to me like a, a co-production of knowledge, which is something that we've been trying to understand for a long time. And um, I've been quite honored to be to be a part of it and to work with both you and, and Allison. So thank you very much. Thank you for this opportunity. And I think we'll leave things there. Great, thank you. And thank you both. This has been a, a wonderful collaboration in the last 60 minutes and, and for the last couple of years, bringing this project to fruition. Thank you. <laughs>